Well, let's take them in like different order because we make the question about what is the most authentic opinion on niqab. This is something I've done a lot of research upon for a lot of years. I wrote an article on this way back, maybe the first article that I, at least that I ever saw online. I had a tripod website, it was Ibn Farooq tripod. I saw all there was and wrote about the niqab. And I collected evidences for it. I looked at both views. Um, the classic idea that we get fed today is there are two views. One is that it's far, wajib, one is that it's mustahab. But the reality is if you look at the older books of fiqh, you see a kind of a different view, which is that no doubt that the majority of the ulama took to it being an obligation, but they put it at certain situations. Meaning if the woman is older and there is no um, fear of fitna, then many of the earlier fuqaha like the Hanafiya and others, they took it back to being mustahab. But if she was younger or there's a fear of fitna, then they took it to be wajib or farq. Yani. So this is a very classic view that we see. Many of the ulama took it to be mutlaqan, to be fard as uh, Sheikh Abdul ibn Baz, Sheikh Ibn Taymin, Sheikh Saleh al-Fawzan. Sheikh Ibn Jibreen, many of the great uh, contemporary scholars, and many earlier, even many aqwal from Imam Ahmed and Imam Malik, where they said even the nail, the woman should be covered, and so on. These were the early classic scholars that took this view. Many other ulema, they took it to be mustahab, and from the contemporary ulema, Sheikh Albani being a, a well-known example. Personally, the evidences to show its obligation to me are the strongest. Those like the hadith of uh, Asma radiallahu anha, but also some talked about the face and hands. We know Khalid ibn Darif never met Aisha radiallahu anha, so that hadith is weak. Um, and so on. And the other hadith, when you look at the hadith from Ibn Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu in the tafsir of Surah Al Ahzab, where he talks about the niqab and he demonstrates it and everything, well, they're very clear and strong. So, to me, those evidences are stronger. Many ulama, like Sheikh uh, Ibn al Taymin, has written a risala on this. and Sheikh Ibn Baz, they're very clear with the evidences. But let's take it, even if somebody takes it to be mustahab, it's still good. Mustahab doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, right? So, that's something you have to keep in mind. Now to take it to the, so just to answer, to me, the stronger opinion that is wajib, especially when there are places of fitna. Like, when you go to the haram nowadays, people say, oh, in the haram you don't wear niqab. No, no, no. Niqab, a piece of cloth, is a different issue. Covering your face is a different issue. Aisha radiyanha, she said, we took the khimar and covered our face anytime non-mahram came close to us. In the haram right now, non-mahram always close to you. So to cover your face, even if you don't do it with a piece of cloth called the niqab, but with your khimar, with your cloth, covering your face, tying it, pinning it, is very important in the haram because of fitna that can happen. If somebody is young, if somebody, uh, even if they're not necessarily young, but there's a chance of fitna, then no doubt, even those ulema they take it to be mustahab in that situation would consider it wajib. So that is the safest and best opinion that you wear the niqab as an obligation. If you take the view that it's mustahab, and I have respect for those scholars and people that take that view, you still should do it because it's mustahab. You want to do it. You don't want to make salah and fard and just be like, I'm just going to make it with the bare minimum. I'm just reading Al-Fatiha, no surah afterward. I'm just doing one subhanahu wa ta'ala, not three... No, you want to make your salah beautiful. You want to do your hijab the best. You know, as men, we don't say, okay, the minimum aura is just from the navel to the knee, so I'm going to go to the masjid and some shorts and a, a, a t-shirt. No, we wear the best to try to wear the most most concealing, the most um, uh, haya, like, you know, for men even, we try to wear clothes that have the most uh, dignified manner, right? Most mustahab. So, even if you take the mustahab, you should do it. Okay? Now to the second question, that if the father is not allowing you to wear the niqab, you should advise your father and tell him that obedience is only in what's good and right. If your parents tell you to not do something that's a part of Islam, then this is wrong. Right? Even if it's mustahab. And if your parents tell you don't pray nafal salawat or don't, uh, go for Umrah, that's a nafal Umrah. That's wrong. They shouldn't. And you should not obey them in that because that is in a, a, a 
going khalif, going against the deen. Unless they have some reason, unless there's like maybe danger in your society, like real danger, not like, oh, people are going to mock you, but maybe, you know, like after 9-11 in America, there was a time that it was very dangerous for Muslim sisters. We understand that situation. And in that situation, if they rolled it back a little, that's understandable, right? Because there's threat to life. But after that, nowadays, you don't have that situation. So in that situation, you should advise your parents, first off, nicely, that, look, I want to do something that's good. Even if it's mustahab, it's something good. Why would you want to stop me from doing something good? And tell them that obedience is that which is good and right. There is no obedience to the makhluk in, in disobedience to the khaliq. Eh? Even in things that are mustahab, you should try to do them. Now, if there is going to be harm to you, like maybe your parents will get abusive or you know, maybe they'll, you know, the problems are unbearable, then khalas, you wear where the best you can wear, maybe wear a mask or whatever you can until you get married and then you keep your niyyah to wear the full proper Islamic uh, hijab. Uh, early question.